right, good evening everyone, good evening. We're gonna begin with congregational singing tonight, hymn number 77, 77 in your hymn book. God sees the heart, let's go ahead and stand as we begin. Stand and sing hymn number 77. service, but so glad that we could have this uh, men's quartet from Baptist College of Ministry. You'll be introduced to them here in a little bit. Some of you may have had a chance to meet them a little bit at their table, but glad to have you here. Everybody's combined tonight, and we're thankful for a little bit cooler weather. We're going to begin in prayer, and then you can have a seat. Just a few announcements, and we're going to turn things over to the Baptist College of Ministry. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lord, we are thankful for your goodness, your mercy, your love, your faithfulness. What a wonderful God you are. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together tonight here on this Thursday night and uh, worship together, Lord, encourage one another, fellowship, be able to be encouraged and challenged through the singing of the Word of God, Bible principles, hear uh, the Word of God preached. We thank you for these young men. And Lord, we ask your blessing and tonight as they minister to us. And then, Lord, as they are on the road quite a bit, several weeks still left of ministering in different churches and different states, pray that you'll keep them fresh, their hearts tender, give them strength, Lord, for each time as they travel. And Lord, we pray tonight we'd be an encouragement and blessing to them. Lord, you know the need. We know there are quite a few on vacation. We have several in our church family that have physical challenges. Lord, probably watching from home right now. Thank you, Lord, for live stream that folks can watch from home when ill or under the weather out of town. And I do pray, Lord, tonight that you'd be honored and glorified by everything that's done. Lord, I pray we've come tonight with an open heart, not to be entertained, but Lord, to hear the word of God, to draw our attention more to you and to have our hearts attentive for the preaching of the word of God. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, it's so good to have these guys. They got in today about 4.30 and traveled from more central PA. They've got to hit the road tomorrow, going down south. They've been all over the place. Still have a couple weeks left to go. We had a good opportunity to meet them and enjoy some fellowship with them at dinner tonight. So this time we're going to turn it over to you men. Looking forward to having you tonight. Rise up, O men of God, have done with Rise. 
the Voices of Truth from Baptist College of Ministry. We're glad to be here with you guys this evening. My name is Josiah Remers and I'm on staff at the college. My name is Elijah Bennett and I'm from Iguanago, Wisconsin. I'm a junior in the college pursuing a degree in pastoral and music leadership. My name is Carson Ziemer. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, going into my senior year and I'm studying missions. My name is Caleb Royalty. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a junior pursuing missions. At the piano, we have George Hadley. He's from upstate New York and he's pursuing degrees in music and pastoral. We're going to sing three more songs now, Revive Us Again, The Banner of the Cross, and Throw Out the Lifeline. Hallelujah, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. was slain, who has borne all our sins, and has cleansed every stain. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love, may each soul be rekindled with fire from above, from above. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Find the glory, revive us again. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Dare to stand like Joshua. Dare to say the word. Dare to stand and fight for. And raise his mighty sword. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of thy king. As an ensign fair we lift it up today while as ransomed ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss and to crown him king. Toil and sing neath the banner of the cross. Fight then, good soldiers, fight and be true. Fight for the right, for the Lord is with you. Stand like Joshua, dare to do or die, dare to live like Daniel, dare to raise the banner high. Though the foe may rage and gather as the flood, let the standard be displayed. And beneath its folds as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss. And to crown him king we'll toil and see.
floats the lifeline across the dark wave. There is a brother whom someone should save. Somebody's brother, oh, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline his peril to share? Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is sinking today. Man sinking in anguish where you've never been. Winds of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. With a season of rescue be o'er, soon will they drift to eternity shore. Makes then, my brother, no time for delay, but throw out the lifeline and save them, save them today. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Throw out the lifeline, save them today. Amen. That song encourages us as believers to throw out the lifeline. Save them today, because many are sinking around us. And he says, hasten, my brother, no time for delay. Around the world, there's 7,000 people groups that are classified as unreached. That means they don't have enough gospel presence there for, the, for anyone in there to hear about the gospel, and hear how Christ has died for their sins and how he can save them. Among those 7,000 people groups are about 4.3 billion people. That's about half the world's population is considered unreached. And that's not even counting the people within reached parts of the world that still haven't heard about Jesus or don't have a good church where they live or the Bible even, you know, accessible to them. Baptist College of Ministry exists to train young people to take the tools that they're given in college and to go, to go to the uttermost, to go maybe their own town, maybe their own Jerusalem, maybe Samaria, Judea, or even around the world with the gospel. So we're going to show a video now just about our college and just tell you a little more about Baptist College of Ministry and how we do that. And then I'm going to have Carson come and he's going to give a testimony. Then Elijah will come a little bit later in the service and give a testimony. Baptist College of Ministry, where the impossible becomes possible, the average becomes extraordinary, and the future is limitless. The BCM experience isn't just about receiving knowledge, it's about being transformed from the inside out so that you can turn the world upside down. In a world plagued by turmoil and chaos, there has never been a greater need for young people who are fully committed to giving their lives for the cause of Christ. In an age of impossibilities, here at Baptist College of Ministry, we believe that God still does miracles. From the very beginning, BCM has been steadfast in its mission to train leaders for the local church through the local church. With hundreds of graduates serving around the globe and a thriving student body dedicated to pursuing Jesus and His Great Commission, Baptist College of Ministry is more than a college. It's a cause. At BCM, our educational philosophy is grounded in the belief that true education transcends the boundaries of the classroom. We believe timeless excellence produces generational impact. Our rigorous curriculum and personalized mentorship are designed to produce competent and sacrificial leaders who are fully equipped for dynamic local church ministry. Every student enrolls in a Bible major where they delve deep into general studies, Bible doctrines, and ministry philosophy, 
establishing a rock-solid foundation for their future in ministry. But it doesn't stop there. We offer a range of additional specialized ministry majors, including a comprehensive pastoral leadership program and a revival-focused evangelism leadership degree, complete with personalized internships and one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Propelled by a well-rounded, Christ-centered philosophy, our primary and secondary education programs produce proficient educational leaders equipped to lead in discipleship ministry in church, school, and home settings. For those called to the regions beyond, our missions program produces pioneer church leaders among the unreached of the world through intentional training in spiritual character and disciple-making strategies. Our unique Boots on the Ground program includes hands-on experiences across the globe from internships abroad to intensive two-week missions camps. Designed to train leaders for local church music ministry, our music program is world-renowned, combining experienced faculty and a strong pedagogical framework to produce the highest standards of musicianship. We develop not only exceptional musicians, but also masterful teachers who can pass their excellence on to the next generation. Outside the classroom, students are invited to immerse themselves in BCM's vibrant student life. Our activities and events foster spiritual growth, build lifelong friendships, and provide meaningful ministry opportunities. BCM's student-led fellowships form the backbone of student life, enabling students to cultivate practical leadership skills and strengthen their faith. Weekly fellowship chapels, intramural sports, prayer meetings, and missions trips are just a few ways students can serve together in local and global opportunities. The dormitory life at BCM is just as encouraging, with cozy living spaces and a welcoming atmosphere that encourages personal discipline and accountability. Our dedicated staff provides a comfortable, home-like environment where students can focus on their studies while developing in their walk with the Lord. Located on a lovely 30-acre campus in southeastern Wisconsin, BCM offers the perfect setting for students to thrive, both academically and spiritually. At BCM, ministry begins now, not after college. Our students don't just learn about the local church, they experience the local church in action. They are fully immersed in the life of Falls Baptist Church as they engage in vibrant small group Bible studies and sacrificially invest in one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationships through a wide variety of ministries including youth, preschool, elementary, and bus. Opportunities abound for students to serve alongside dedicated members of Falls Baptist Church as they nurture lasting relationships in the community and transform people's lives for eternity. BCM students also play major roles in significant outreach events, reaching thousands from the greater Milwaukee area with the gospel. From Vacation Bible School and the annual Easter production to the spectacular Christmas festival and Veterans Day banquet, students make an eternal difference by living for a vision bigger than themselves. Join us as we passionately pursue Christ. Join us as we powerfully proclaim His name. Join us as we prepare the next generation of leaders. Join us as we turn the world upside down for Jesus. For Jesus. BCM, more than a college, a cause. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. And like I said, my name is Carson and I'm from South Carolina. I just wanna share a brief testimony about how God led me to the school there. And so you may be wondering how a boy way down south heard about a college way up in Wisconsin. I'm kind of wondering the same thing myself. But uh, God moved us to a new church my junior year of high school. And the pastor there was a graduate of the college. And before that time, I had never heard of the college before. And I kind of had my heart set at another college down south. And people began recommending, Carson, you should pray about this college. You should think about going here. And I thought, that's way too far north. That's way too cold. That's, that's not going to happen. But I said, fine, I'll, I'll pray about it. And so I began praying my senior year. I said, Lord, if you want me to go to this college, would you allow me an opportunity to visit the college at some point in my senior year? I didn't tell my parents about that. I didn't tell anyone else. This was just between me and God. And at the time, I was involved in Bible quizzing, and there were some tournaments held across the, across the nation, really. And it turns out that Falls Baptist Church, the church that Baptist College of Ministry is out of, they host a tournament every year in January. And I'm the youngest of eight children, and so a homeschool family, and all my teammates had graduated, so I was kind of all by myself. So I was joined with a team from Florida at that point, and they offered to fly me to Wisconsin. They paid for my hotel, they paid for food, they paid for everything. So everything was paid for, I was able to see the college and visit the, the faculty there, and, 
it was so clear that God had answered that prayer. So I, it kind of, I wasn't fully committed then. I was like, okay, that was, that was neat, but it was just really the Lord. And I began, set, began to pray, continue to pray. And I went back in March for a Victor Conference that they have every year. And God did such a work in my heart at the Victor Conference. I experienced God in a way I'd never experienced him before. And God began convicting me. I, I had a lot of things I was hiding from my parents uh, all throughout high school. And I realized I was never going to get victory over those things if I never confessed them, if I never got them right with my parents. And so I made a list of everything that I'd been hiding from them, uh, from cheating on homework to personal purity issues. I was having everything. I wrote down every single thing that I could think of. And I went home and I talked to my parents. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But I told them every last thing I've been hiding from them for six plus years. And they were shocked. They were stunned. But the Lord showed up in my life in such a way that I'd never experienced before. And I knew that God wanted me at Baptist College of Ministry. His voice was so clear at that point. And I, I talked to young people a lot in high school that are considering different colleges. And I just encouraged them, you have to know where God wants you. And you get that by hearing the voice of God. And I'm so glad that God has led me to that college. And I'm so thankful for the, the way that he did it, just miraculous. And I, I'm persuaded that that's where he wants me. And there's been times where it's been difficult, times where I've wanted to quit, but I can point back to the time when, in high school where God answered my prayer, and he made it very clear. And there's no doubt in my mind that God wants me there, and he's going to keep me there. I'm excited to see how he's provided financial, financially for me thus far, and how he's going to continue to provide. So at this time, the guys are going to come back, and we're going to do some more singing. <laughs> I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with fruit. He formed thy creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders heart is blamed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey thy crown, I tread for gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life for thee is ever in thy care, and everywhere that men can be. Thou God, O oh God, thou art present there. I sing the power of God, the mighty power of God. God delivered Daniel from the lions, then with no struggle and no strife. And he gave him victory over wicked men who had sought to take his life. In the same wonderful way, in the same wonderful way, God can still answer prayer and show his mighty power in the same wonderful way. When Elijah challenged all the men of Baal to pray for fire to fall, they were put to open shame and could but fail, but the Lord heard Elijah's call. In the same wonderful way, in the same wonderful way, God can still answer prayer and show his mighty power in the same wonderful way. Set them free in 
in the same wonderful way, in the same wonderful way. God can still answer prayer and show his mighty power in the same wonderful way. Through the ages, when the saints in faith would pray and for God's blessing plead, he responded, sent the answer on its way that would fully meet their need. In the same wonderful way, in the same wonderful way, God can still answer prayer and show his mighty power. In the same wonderful way. Oh, man, I always enjoy singing that song. My name's Elijah Bennett. I introduced myself earlier, and I am from McQuanago, Wisconsin. Who here has heard of McQuanago? Just a few. That's about what I expected. It's a smaller town, a little southwest of Milwaukee, around uh, 8,000 folks. I'm not sure what it is here, but I'm guessing that's about a similar size or so. I have a little bit of a different background to the rest of the guys in my group, so I'll just share a little bit of what God's done in uh, my personal life and my family as well and how he's led me to BCM. I did not grow up in a Christian home. Actually, both of my parents struggled with different substance abuse problems when I was younger. At the age of, I want to say around five or six, my parents uh, divorced, yet they tried to make things seem normal by still living together, providing some semblance of home. I recall when I was six years old, actually, my mom went to prison for a year, and I remember times in my life when we would uh, go to visit my mom in jail for uh, some of her substance abuse problems. It's a very unique uh, situation that I had to deal with, but as I got older, uh, my parents were able to get some measure of uh, victory over some of those different things, and as I got older, they lived together and made things seem as normal as possible for me. As I entered my teenage years, however, the fact of having not only a somewhat broken home situation, but as well just emptiness in my life, having no uh, spiritual influence whatsoever, began to catch up. My dad went to Catholic Church when he was younger, but he pretty much threw a lot of that away. All we did was go to church, Catholic Church maybe twice a year. Uh, but the fact is, is that that can't fill the hole in each one of our lives. In my life, it didn't fill it. In dad's life, it didn't fill it. In mom's life, it didn't fill it. We were empty. Dad and I would try to uh, find ways to fill emptiness by going to rock concerts and doing all kinds of different things, but we would do all these different events, but it was still empty. As I entered my uh, freshman year of high school, I began to try to figure out where I was in the world, and that still led to more emptiness. And I didn't know what I was needing, but I was needing something. And through that, God was uh, beginning to work in my life and open up uh, me spiritually for what he was going to do soon. In 2018, at the beginning of the year, my dad contracted out a shed company from our church. It's uh, run by actually a graduate of a Baptist College of Ministry. And this graduate took the opportunity to uh, give the gospel to my dad. And my dad was not saved right away, but that was the first time for him hearing the gospel. He was impressed with their work. And uh, through the course of events, I worked where I got a job with them. And through working for them is where I heard the gospel for the first time. You know, I put up a shield of atheism those first couple days, said, I don't want anything to do with your God. But God began to break through that, show me my emptiness, show me the fact that these men that worked for the Shed Company had life, spiritual life, that I didn't have. And over the course of a month, God worked in my heart, and eventually July 30th, 2018, I turned from my sin and trusted Jesus Christ. And, you know, I tell people I had no idea what God was wanting to do in my life from that point, but God had a plan. A couple months after that, my dad trusted Jesus Christ, and uh, he began to grow us. Once COVID year hit, 2020, I was kind of headed downwards, but when church reopened, I just ex began to explode spiritually, so to speak. God began to really work on my heart, my dad's heart. We were moving forward, and the uh, pastor brought it to my dad's attention that he was living with my mom unmarried, and dad took the face step to remarry mom. And so my parents remarried, and shortly after that, my mom got saved. And I uh, praise the Lord for what he's done completely uh, changing around my home situation, I tell people, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but I go home to a Christian home. And grateful that I have both parents faithfully serving the Lord uh, at my house and, and home. And one thing I, I like to, to share is that God is still in the business of doing miracles. The man that led, our fam that led me to the Lord personally and, and uh, brought the gospel to our home, he was a graduate of BCM. You know, he got a vision at college of what God could do through his life. 
And as a current student now, I don't have time to share uh, everything that God's done, but there's one thing that I've learned. It's that God is in the business of doing miracles. And he still wants to reach people. There's families just like mine that God wants to reach with the gospel. I guarantee even here. Uh, so that's just one big thing I've learned in my time here even at school. At this time, the guys are going to come up. We're going to sing, Rejoice the Lord is King. And if I could point out that third verse says to rejoice in glorious hope because our God is coming back. Uh, so we can praise him for that. The Lord is King, Lord God and King I adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Victory won. May I read. 
which heaven's joys all bright and sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, my vision, still be my vision. Go ahead and take your Bible and turn to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 22. You probably noticed when you came in tonight, we have a table back there in the lobby, and usually I bring books and resources up here to show you, but I forgot to, so I'll have to just explain it here briefly. Back there we have some books, um, we have a book by John R. Rice, not by him, I'm sorry, it's about him, written by his grandson who actually teaches at our college. So that book's back there, we have another book, um, a devotional from John chapter 13 to 17 about the abundant Christian life and how we can experience that. There's some more books back there as well. We have CDs from our college that we produce Full choir arrangements, orchestra arrangements, um, even just piano and other instrumentals there. So I encourage you to take a look back there at the CDs and books. Our college material is also in the same table. So you'll find resources, um, brochures just about the school. Obviously, we're here to answer any questions you may have, teens or parents or anyone here. We'd be happy to answer any question you may have about our school. Don't be afraid to ask anything, and I mean that. Um, so I'd encourage you to stop back there at our table and look at the different resources we have and the material about the school. All right, we're in the book of Ezekiel here. Ezekiel chapter 22, we'll start reading here in verse 23. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They have devoured souls, they have taken treasure and precious things. They have, done, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. And they have put no difference between the holy and profaned. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, and to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed with the untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies, and saying unto them, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken." The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Look at verse 30. And I sought for a man among them who should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Let's pray. Lord, we're coming to you here tonight, Lord. We're asking that you would anoint us, Father. Anoint me as I, as I preach from your word here, Father, with the truth here in this passage come alive. To us, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us and would speak to us here tonight, Father. We ask this in your name. Amen. How many of you here have ridden a mule before? A mule. We were in New York City um, just last weekend, and I asked the same question, and nobody raised their hand. Of course, hardly any of them even own cars because they hit the subway everywhere. Um, and I had the opportunity to ride a mule once. It was actually the first year I traveled in an ensemble back in 2021. I was a junior in college. And it was one of the first churches we were at, and the pastor there took us back to his, his farm where he lived after the evening service. And he had dinner there for us, and he was like, you know what, just take some time to relax, take my four-wheeler out on the ATV. And I got a mule here, if any of you want to ride that, go ahead. And I actually did not ride the mule that night, and I'm glad I did not, because, well, for one, it was getting dark, and I was like, there's no lamp on this mule, but there's a lamp on the four-wheeler, so I think I'll take that. Uh, my friend jumped on the mule. Um, he was on our team as well, and you know, he went off into the dark and the trails. And the mule, you know what, that mule had a mind of its own. It headed a certain direction. My friend did not know the, the layout of the, the property, and he didn't know how to even direct the mule to go where he wanted it to go. So that mule just started wandering off. Um, and our friend got lost there, and he had to get some help from the pastor. The pastor's son went out and found him um, a while later, because the mule was actually attracted to a pile of corn that was in the neighbor's yard. Um, so, you know, obviously, mules are very stubborn creatures. And unfortunately, obviously, we're the same way sometimes as humans. God has a will for our life and a direction he wants us to head, but many times we don't obey him. We don't listen to his voice. And God oftentimes will speak to us and say, I want you to go here. I want you to do this with your life. I want you to, to, to you know, take this path. And we don't follow him because we're stubborn like that mule. We have a mind of our own and a path we want ahead, and we don't listen to the voice of God, unfortunately. You know, the children of Israel were the same way. 
God, time and again, was so merciful to them, and they turned their back on God. I think about how he brought them out of the house of Egypt, the house of bondage. The children of Israel disobeyed God so many times. They were there in Egypt. Obviously, he chose, he chose the children of Israel through Abraham and his descendants there, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he loved them and said, you are my people. I want you for myself. And they obviously were sold into the land of Egypt, and God delivered them. He brought them out of the house of bondage and through the wilderness, the wilderness wanderings there, and he brought them through there time and time again. He did miracles for them, despite their rebellion, despite their, their attitude towards God. He had mercy on them and said, I love you, and I've got to keep bringing you through this land. Time and again, they were like that mule that wanted to go their own way, and they would turn to the false gods, even there in the wilderness, that golden calf, and start worshiping it and, and having immorality among them. And God was merciful to them. Of course, he had punishments, but he still brought them through into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and he drove out the inhabitants of that land for them. Obviously, they had to take, you know, ownership of the part God wanted them to do in that, and many of them actually didn't, unfortunately, in the rebellion. But God drove out many of those those cities, especially the beginning, I think of Jericho and and Ai and the other ones, that he enabled them to to drive out the inhabitants of the land thereof. Because God, he loved his people, and he wanted to give them the land he promised to their descent, to their, their forefathers. But time and again, I think of the book of Judges, where they brought in Baal and other prophets, and they worshipped them and bowed down to these, these gods of stone and wood when they had been brought out of Egypt by the one true God, a real God, who actually could do miracles for them and who actually did love them and wanted what was best for them. They turned their back on him and chose the gods of the land around them, the gods who weren't strong enough to stand against the one true God who actually drove those inhabitants out. They chose those gods over their God. That doesn't make sense. And oftentimes we're the same way. Not doing the exact same thing, but we, we turn our backs on God sometimes. We rebel against him when he gives us commandments and shows us paths and directions that he wanted to go with our lives. And I think about the book of Ezekiel here. You know, he's a prophet and he's coming to the children of Israel saying, this is the word of the Lord. This is where you're at. Look what he says there. He says, um, in verse 25, there's a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion. Their prophets are being described as lions there in the children of Israel. They're ravening the prey. They've devoured souls. They've taken treasure and precious things. They've made her many widows in the midst thereof. He's saying, your prophets in the land have turned their back on me. They're like, they're like animals just devouring the people of the land. Look at verse 26. Her priests, mind, mind you, these are, these are people who are supposed to be working in the temple, They should know the law of God. They're supposed to be um, leading out in the worship there in the land and the sacrifices. The priests were the ones who were supposed to be spiritual. Look what it says here. Her priests have violated my law and they have profaned mine holy things. They violated the law they were supposed to know, the book of God. They violated it, the Torah. The commands God gave them as his special people to follow, they violated them. And they profaned my unholy things. Look what it says there. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them. Things that were supposed to be holy, they took them and meshed them with things that were of the world. Sounds like things that happen in a lot of churches today in America. Pastors that take their churches down a path that's, that's not good. They bring the things of the world into the church. Same thing was happening in Israel. The priests have violated God's law. Look at verse 27 even. The, the, the government in the land that was supposed to be set up by God had turned their back on God. 27. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves. They come in packs and they, 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 they chase down and, and devour people in the land. It says, ravening the prey to shed blood and destroy souls and get dishonest gain. I can only imagine what that must have looked like there in the land with the princes there. You know, I, I think of the God's command to the kings. They were to take their copy of the law and write their own and meditate in it all the days that they were, they were king. And here, the government that was in the land this time are like wolves, ravening the people of the land. He's comparing them to wolves. That's, that's not a good comparison. Verse 28, and our prophets have daubed the untempered mortar, mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies, and saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. That's a dangerous thing, putting words in the mouth of God. As a prophet, you're supposed to declare the words of the Lord. 
And these prophets aren't doing that. They're taking God's words and, and, and not even bothering with them. They're, they're putting their own words and saying, God said this, and bringing messages of lies to God's people. Verse 29 says, The people of the land have, have used oppression, exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. We have the people of the land mentioned here. We have the prophets, the priests. These are, all, these are essentially most categories of, of, of society here I mentioned, saying they're corrupted. The nation of Israel is in trouble here. And that's when we come to verse 30, which I want to spend most of our time here. He says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found none. I needed someone to stand up for what was right, someone to stand up for what's good and what I commanded them and what I, I called my people to. And I couldn't find anybody. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, speak of the children of Israel, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I chose you as my people, a peculiar nation, a holy nation, I'm sorry, a peculiar people, for his own glory. And anything but God's glory is what was being declared here in the nation of Israel at this time. And he sought for just a man, a man to stand up for what was right. A man to stand up for God. And he couldn't find anybody. He uses the term there, stand in the gap, make up the hedge. That's almost a military term there. Um, if you think of a walled city, um, if you're part of the wall broken down there in that time, the commander would, would send some men over to go stand in that gap, make up the hedge, and to defend that and not allow the enemy to come in. And that's exactly what God's looking for here. He's saying, there's problems here. There's vulnerabilities. There's so much corruption. I need someone to stand up for what's right. To stand up and defend the truth. To stand up and be my mouthpiece and my messenger. And he couldn't find anybody. I think of times throughout, um, I guess even the Bible, where men stood up for what was right. Um, turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Noah wasn't a perfect man by, by any means. But he stood up for what was right when God told him to. He built an ark, something that did not make sense, something that probably nobody in his time period, even himself, had no idea what that even was or what it was for. But when God told him to build it, he built it. Look at verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah was able to stand up for what was right because he walked with God. Let me tell you, if you're going to be a man or woman that stands in the gap and rises up when everything around you, when people around you are falling like flies and doing wrong and, and, and you know, compromising the truth, if you're going to be one that stands up for what's right, you're going to have to walk with God like Noah. I would dare say Noah's time period was even worse than ours today. I don't know exactly. I, haven't, I wasn't there. Obviously, none of us were. But it was so bad that God destroyed the world with a flood. It was that bad. He said, I've got to start it over. This is just, this is wickedness. But Noah walked with God. It doesn't matter how bad things are around you. If you walk with God, you can stand in the gap. You can stand up for what's right. I think of Joseph, a man who, who faced incredible temptation, a man who was rejected by his family, his brothers, was sold into Egypt, a place that was wicked, and where he could have done anything he wanted. Nobody, nobody would know that mattered. No one in his family, no one he grew up around, no one who knew the law of God would even know if he sinned. He was there in Potiphar's, Potiphar's house there, you know, working away as a slave. He's promoted and promoted, and he, was, he, you know, he, he reached a, definitely a, a good place there in Potiphar's house uh, in leadership. And he was confronted with temptation to do wrong. Nobody would have known. But he did what was right. Obviously, we know the story. He went in, into the prison there, and even there, God had favor on him, and he did what was right. He walked with God there. And God used his testimony, and because he did what was right, to save his family from starvation and to really save God's people. Even the nation of, of Egypt, for that matter, and the whole world, God used him because he was a man of faith, a man that walked with God. God used him in a mighty way. I think of Josiah even, King Josiah. In Second Chronicles 34, verse 2, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father. There were so many kings before him that did wrong and brought in false gods and turned their back on the one true God. 
And it says he walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. In the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and molten images. He decided, you know what? I'm going to do what's right. Our God is Jehovah, not these gods. And he purged them out of the land and turned his face and encouraged the nation of Israel to turn towards God. He was a man that stood in the gap in his land, in his time. It says when he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. Seeking after God, walking with God, is what enables men to be men of faith, men who stand up for what's right and to stand in the gap, like God's looking for here in Ezekiel chapter, chapter 22. He's looking for men who are going to stand up and not care what's happening in society, not care what's happening around them, not, not care. Young person, God has a plan for your life. And there's so much happening around us. There's, there's so much pressure that you're facing right now and you will face even more in the future to do wrong and to go after the ways of the world. Be a young person that walks with God. It doesn't matter what, what you're going to face. It doesn't matter what kind of pressures you'll, you'll be under. If you walk with God, none of that's going to matter. If, you're, if you're, your relationship with God is solid, it doesn't matter what, what, what's going to get thrown your way because you know what's right and you know God's real. And you have that relationship with God that can't be shaken. I think of just the need in our country, and the need around the world. So many, so many churches, I was just talking with, with our, our pastor, there's so many churches that do not have good pastors. So many churches that, that are dying. Men of God have obviously, you know, that run their course and they've, they've retired. Maybe missionaries have come off the field. And I think of the state of our country. Not a lot of young people are rising up and saying, I will go. I will fill the shoes of, of, of the pastor that used to pastor this church. I will, I will go and take the gospel out you know, to, to the world and the parts, the regions that haven't heard of Christ before. I, I won't go. Not many young people are going. They're turning their back on the faith they were raised up in. And I've seen it. I've traveled around so much, and I, I've just seen young people who don't care about the things of God. They don't care about, about God's will for life. They have, they have their own dreams and desires. And it's a sickening state to be in. Often we're so much like that mule I talked about. We want what we want. That mule wanted a pile of corn. Often we, we have something, our sights set on maybe something temporal. Maybe monetary things, maybe fame, maybe just a comfortable life. I don't know. Maybe a relationship. If our sight's set on that, we think we want that, and we think that'll bring happiness. But when truly, there's nothing more happy and satisfying and fulfilling than being in the very center of the will of God. You can't replace that. I, I think of, you know, maybe someone who's on their deathbed and thinking over their life, you know, we're all going to be there at some point. We're all going to be there. We don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or it could be 80 years from now. I don't know. But you know, when you're, when you're lying there and you're breathing your last breath, I want to, at least for myself, I want to know that I lived and I served God. I didn't waste my life. And I trust that's the prayer of everyone here today. And you know what? If, if we make small compromises now, we make small, especially as a young person, and we make small decisions to follow our flesh and our own desires, we're going to get to the end of our life and realize, I wasted my life. I had one chance to live for God, and I wasted it. Often when I'm out soul winning, I talk to people about you know, eternity and their life here in this earth and how it's so important in their life here in this earth. They, they make the decision to, to trust in Christ as their Savior and live for him. I describe it as a rope stretching out into, into you know, the sky where you can't see the end of it. That's eternity. And your life here in this earth is just a small little piece of tape on that rope. It's so minuscule in comparison to eternity. And even for us Christians... We don't have much time to serve Jesus. God gave us just a couple years on earth to serve him. He didn't save us and then bring us you know, into heaven. No, he saved us and kept us here on this earth because he has a mission for us. He created us for a certain reason and for a specific purpose. We're not an accident. We didn't just come from monkeys or evolve or something. No, we know that. We're created by God for his will. And God is looking for young men and women who will stand up and say, I will stand in the gap. I will stand for truth. I will follow my God. I think of just the need around the world. Um, there's, 
there's a, mission, a missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. I think a lot of us have probably heard of him. And he obviously was used by God in China to bring the gospel to many who had never heard of Christ before. He tells a story about, about this man who fell overboard um, while he and, and his friend, his friend was actually the one that fell overboard, were crossing a body of water. And there were some fishermen who were nearby. And so Hudson Taylor, he can't swim himself. And his friend can't swim. And he calls the, the fisherman and says, Come, will you help save me? I'm sorry, help save my friend. Help me. You know, what, what can we do to pull him out of the water? And they kind of ignore him, kind of, you know, say, Sorry, we can't really help. We're busy. And he's like, this man's drowning. Why don't you guys care about this? Why aren't you coming over to help me? Please, please. He, he starts imploring them and, and begging them to come over and save his friend. And they say, sorry, it's not convenient. And he tries to bribe them, offers them, you know, five pounds. And they say, it's not enough. It's not enough. Give us 30. He says, I only have 15. So for the price of 15 pounds, they eventually come over and they get their fishing nets and they pull his friend out of the water. But unfortunately, it's been too late. And that man drowned in the water because the fishermen didn't care enough to come save him in time. I think of how much that's happening around us. We're too busy and consumed with our own life. We're too busy and consumed with, with things that are temporal, things that are going to burn up, that we don't care about the people that are drowning around us. We miss the reason God had us here on this earth because we're too busy being fishermen. When God's called us to go fish for men, we missed the point. Hudson Taylor also told a story um, about a man he actually won to Christ. And this man's dad was a Buddhist priest. And, and he says that the man asked him, how long have you known about this good news in your country? Hudson Taylor said reluctantly, we've known about it for a long time, and it's been hundreds of years. And the man responded, hundreds of years? And you never came to tell us. My father sought the truth. He sought it long and died without finding it. Why didn't you come sooner? His dad was searching and never found the truth that Hudson Taylor gave to this man. And I think of how many around the world are searching right now, waiting for somebody to go tell them. And we're, we're, we're in our boats like those fishermen, just, you know, plodding along with, with our life. And we're enjoying, you know, here and now and living a comfortable existence as a Christian. A young person, maybe God wants you to go and bring the gospel to some of those 4.3 billion people that are unreached. Maybe God wants you to go to one of those people groups that doesn't have the gospel, doesn't even have a Bible in their language, and they've never heard the name of Jesus. I would encourage you, when God says go, go. We have the Great Commission. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said to go. He said to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. We have the commission, maybe for some of us that's here in our Jerusalem, here in our town. Maybe some of us that's, that's the next state over. Uh, maybe for others it's going to the uttermost. God will show you if you put your life on the altar and say, God, I'm willing to live my life for you, whatever that means. He will show you. Let me encourage you, especially as a young person, stay surrendered to that. Don't let any of your desires and your plans for your life get in the way of God's plans. No. Put those aside and say, God, if you direct me, I will go back to those plans. But for now, I'm pushing those aside, and I want your will for my life. Will you show me whatever it is, and I will do it. I'm not just going to hold on to my things and see, ask me to show you what your will is and then decide if I want to follow it. No. I'm going to completely shove aside my plans and then be open to what your plans are, and then proceed with those, regardless of whatever they are. And that really is God's will for our life. You know, we don't know how long we have on this earth. The Bible says our life is but a vapor. We don't know when our last breath is going to be. You know, I was reminded of that um, two years ago. I had a brother, and we grew up together. You know, he was, he was very close to me. He was a very close friend, and we were homeschooled, so I didn't have a lot of friends that some, people, some of my friends did, you know, in school together. So we were very close. And he passed away very unexpectedly. He was very young, 24 years old, and God took him home to heaven. You know, as, as hard as that was for me and my family, it was a very shocking reminder that I don't know when my last breath on this earth is going to be. It could be tonight. It could be five years from now. It could be ten years from now. I'm not promised tomorrow. Young person, use every breath and every minute of your life you have for Jesus. Live for him 
We want to stand before Christ someday and say, God, I live my life for you. I want to have something to present to him. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I trust that will be the heart of every one of us here today. That when we stand before God, we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. We're going to have a brief invitation here in just a second. I'll ask our piano player just to slip over to the piano. And just before we have a moment of prayer and invitation, I know tonight we had wonderful music. I trusted encouraging the Lord and uh, drew your attention to the words of Scripture. But you heard two testimonies, and then you heard a message from the Word of God. I don't know what God may have used. Maybe God used one of the songs. Maybe God used the testimony. Maybe there's a young person, maybe an adult. You need to do what this young man said. He'd been keeping things hidden from his parents for years. It's not just teens that do that. You're not going to know God's will if you're not presently doing what God says, confess and forsake. Perhaps some of you tonight need to get that list out and say, God, I've got to get some things clean right now tonight before I go to bed. Get those right with God. I need to have the peace of God. Perhaps God's will for you is to share the gospel like the boss did here with the young man. that said, nah, I don't want to hear that stuff. And said, no, I need to do what God says. Uh, maybe God would have you stand in the gap. God's working your heart. Maybe your prayer tonight just simply needs to be, Lord, what, do you want, what would thou have me to do? Like Paul said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I'm willing, Lord. There's nothing. I have no preconceived things, Lord, whatever you want me to do. If God's clearly showed you something tonight in the service, I'd encourage you during the invitation to make that right. You could do that in the pew. You can slip up here at the altar if you need to go to someone. If you need some help, some prayer and counsel. We'll have someone that can pray with you. Cream Mars there in the back, some others. So uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll hear the piano begin to play, and we'll have an invitation. May you be willing to obey what God says. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music. It's a breath of fresh air in a day where we have so much of the world's music, the devil's music, Lord, that we hear all the time on TV, commercials, stores. It's refreshing to hear good, sound, biblical music sung the right way based on the scriptures, Lord. And, uh, Lord, words of, from the right from the word of God. Rise up, O man of God. Be thou my vision. Lord, things that can encourage us and stir us and uh, challenge us. And yet, Lord, uh, the most important is the preaching of the word of God. Thank you for the spoken testimony from two of the young men tonight. How you worked in their heart, Lord, in the area of sin. In the area, Lord, of just receiving Christ and listening to the gospel and getting things so right with you. Lord, we've heard the challenge tonight about... Lord, the controversy you had in those days with Israel and the controversy you have today with America, the church, the believers today. How much I and maybe this church and, and the church at large is very similar to Israel, Lord, where we not kept your commandments, not doing what you'd have us to do, Lord. You're looking for a person, a man, a woman, a young person, a church to stand in the gap, Lord, to take a stand in this wicked world. Lord, I pray tonight during this invitation, if you've convinced, convicted anyone of any known sin, if there's one here tonight, young or old, that needs to be saved and trust Christ as Savior, may be willing to receive the free gift tonight. Lord, if there's someone that needs to pray with someone and get some counsel, someone that needs to confess some sin, make it right with a brother or sister. Lord, I don't know how you may have worked, but I pray now during this invitation, please have your way. May each of us be willing to obey, Lord, as the Holy Spirit leads. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Piano is beginning to play. God worked in your heart. You'd be willing to do business with God tonight. Maybe slip up to the altar. Get some things right with God. Make a commitment. Confess some things. How about it, young person? You right with mom and dad tonight? Any known sin? Got anything you're hiding from them? You're willing to get that right? Maybe it's not just teens, but an adult. Maybe you've got some hidden things from your spouse from your boss. God says, I want you to get that right. Maybe God's been working in your heart in the area of surrender. God's calling you to preach, calling you to be a missionary, calling you to say, God, I'm available. I don't know what you'd have. It's a little scary, but I'm available. I've got plans, but Lord, I want your plans. Be willing to confess that and give that to Lord tonight and say, Lord, I'm willing, I'm available. What would you have me to do? Perhaps you have the sweet spirit of the Holy Spirit assuring you that you're right where you need to be tonight. Just keep on going. Don't quit. Don't get discouraged.
one final stanza, not going to delay it, between you and the Lord. When you walk out tonight, will you have the peace of God? Will you have quenched the Spirit?